Friday, May 26th, um, Senate Government Operations, and we're going to be talking about elections. <laughs> and just an aside about elections is that anybody who wants to run for an office has to file with the secretary, with their county clerk or their town clerk by Thursday, by this Thursday. <clears throat> so for all those people out there in the world who are watching and you decided that this is the year you're going to run for something, you have to file by Thursday. Okay, so <clears throat> Betsy and I think we have a draft. Okay. Uh, Hello, yes, I believe I saw it up on, maybe if it's not today, let's see. It was, uh, yes, under today, right, Gail? I believe so. Under my name, today's date, this is the draft. I believe that I sent to the committee last week, the draft 2.1 in yep. regard to the 2020 elections procedure. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so <clears throat> do you wanna uh, tell us what this bill does? Yes. Hello, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. So the General Assembly as part of the uh, COVID related legislation uh, enacted what is now Act Number 92. Um, this was the first GovOps um, COVID legislation. In Act 92 in Section 3, that, was, that section provided the general authority that you can see here on page one of this bill. Um, the current language to address elections in 2020 um, allows the Secretary of State in consultation and agreement with the governor to order or permit <coughs> as applicable appropriate elections procedures for protecting the health, safety, welfare of voters, election workers, and candidates in carrying out elections. And then the bill uh, provides a non-exhaustive list of what this may include. When it says including, um, that's not exhaustive. That's not the whole universe of what these temporary elections procedures <coughs> are, but it did provide some um, uh, examples of what this authority may include. So right now, for 2020, the Secretary of State has this authority to implement temporary elections procedures due to COVID um, so long as the secretary consults with and gets agreement from the governor in regard to what these uh, temporary elections procedures are. Senate GovOps um, took testimony on where the Secretary of State's office and governor are in instituting some of these <coughs> temporary elections procedures. Um, there is still a question about what our elections procedures will be for the 2020 general election. Um, particularly in regard to mailing out general election ballots. And um, so the committee requested this draft bill that you have before you, draft 2.1, um, which would maintain the requirement for the Secretary of State to consult with the governor in ordering or permitting these temporary elections procedures, but it would remove the requirement for the Secretary of State to obtain the agreement of the governor in ordering or permitting these elections procedures. Um, so this would be amending the act that was already passed this past um, recently uh, by the General Assembly. Um, it would amend that act, remove the requirement to obtain the governor's agreement, and this act would take effect on passage. All right, <clears throat> any questions committee for Betsy? I think it's pretty straightforward what it does. Okay, let's, um, I, we have a big list of people here who, <clears throat> so Chris, can we start with uh, Chris Winters and Will Senning? I don't know if Will is with us. She was a moment ago. Okay. And Chris, you are muted. Oh, there you are. I got it finally. Thank you. Um, I, I can start and, um, you know, I think Will is here to answer kind of the mechanical questions, the technical questions, and let you know why we think it's so urgent um, for us to 
to have a decision now, but I can kind of um, start with a, a summary of uh, a very brief summary of, of how we got here. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank everyone for the opportunity <coughs> for um, your patience with us and for giving your valuable time to this really important issue because we just wanna make certain that every Vermonter has the ability to vote safely in what's quite likely going to be a high turnout election in November. And as you've heard many times before from me, from Secretary of State Condos, uh, from Director Senning and from others, we have to plan for this now, even though there's going to be a great deal of uncertainty around what the coming months uh, are going to bring us. So our goal has always been to be as prepared as we can for the worst case scenario. We know this virus is still going to be with us in November. Uh, the experts, including Dr. Levine, are predicting a resurgence at some point. We don't know when, but there are all kinds of experts predicting a resurgence. So we need to do, we need to do now what we can to allow all Vermonters the, to safely exercise their right to vote. The best and most effective way for us to do that, in our view, is to drive down in-person voting in polling places, <coughs> to protect Vermont voters, to protect election officials, and to protect the poll workers who are often among uh, that very vulnerable demographic. The best and most effective way to drive down polling place attendance is to mail every active registered voter a ballot. Voters will still have the ability to, to vote in person, to vote early, to drop off their ballots, or to put them in the mail. Uh, but we need a clear path forward now so we can get to work. We need to get to work without worrying about whether the rug is gonna be pulled out from under us at a later date. And we thank you for passing Act 92 uh, and then for giving us some time to try to reach an agreement with the <coughs> team. We've been diligently trying to get the assurances we need for the last couple of months. Uh, however, after many conversations, a lot of deliberation, many, many hours of work, at the end of the day, we simply still need that clarity and that certainty, and we still don't have it. Uh, until now, we've been hopeful that we could get a decision from the administration to, to go ahead with the amount of assurance that we need uh, but the goalposts have shifted a few times in our latest proposal for a decision now with an opt-out off-ramp to be decided by the governor and secretary of state after the primary has been rejected. Uh, the governor in rejecting that has proposed an alternate decision uh, that would be done by a committee and, and that would take the decision right out of the hands of the governor and the secretary of state and, and we believe that's contrary to what you directed in Act 92. So if the governor's not uh, providing the certainty <coughs> that, we need, uh, and that we need to plan and to be prepared, we can certainly understand why you as a legislature would feel obligated to do something. Uh, in fact, the governor has invited you to do just that. I think he's, he said that to Secretary Condost in their conversation, conversations they've had, and publicly the legislature could do uh, something and remove him from the equation. Uh, he has said publicly that he never asked to be involved and never really wanted to be a part of this decision. Um, so if, if you determine that's the path forward, we can certainly appreciate that. All we know is that we need some certainty soon before we make too many more critical decisions, before we enter into more contracts, invest resources, um, we need that certainty now. So we really, again, thank you for taking this up now. And as I said, Will Senning is also here and he'd be glad to answer any of your questions about the mechanics or why um, decisive action right now is so important. As you can imagine, he's been working nonstop to do what he can to get us ready for every eventuality that's out there planning for worst case scenarios. Um, so thank you. We appreciate the time and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or defer to Will uh, for questions about the mechanics. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions for Chris or should we jump to Will and then we can ask both of them questions? Go to Will. Okay. All right, Will. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Senator White and the committee. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been having very slow internet, some slow internet today, so I'm going without video. That's 
De the Deputy Secretary Winters just summed it up really nicely. I don't have much to add to that. Um, just, just a couple points. I think I have in previous testimony gone into detail about why I think we need to make the decision now from sort of the mechanics standpoint, the contracting um, coordination with the Postal Service. I just, I just got an email from my contact at the Postal Service while Chris was talking um, to talk about the forwarding process. And um, so I've gone into detail about a lot of that. I can answer more questions about it, but I wanted to mention something that occurred to me over the weekend. And um, Chris mentioned <coughs> just the need for clarity and certainty for me, for my staff, for the 246 town clerks, for all of the poll workers that work for those clerks um, and for the voters. I just wanna point out that I still, I get daily inquiries from multiple clerks the plan has a, has a decision been made will when are we going to know what we're doing in november um so that anxiety and that need for clarity and certainty among the clerks i think is real um over the weekend i was thinking about i try to i have to periodically do this right over the last eight weeks as i'm sure we all do during this crisis as we're dealing with everything about the crisis i try to remind myself what would i normally be doing if we weren't in a covid situation right now to make sure i'm dotting the I's and the T's of my work. And the two things that occurred to me that I'm typically really ramping up around this time are a revision to the key booklet that we provide to all of the clerks, which is an election procedures booklet. It's, it's, it's pretty lengthy. It's a, it's a 20, 25, 30 page document, um, nine or 10 appendices with various documents that they need for the elections. Typically, we're, you know, your session is, is closing up a month or so ago, earlier this month, and I'm revising that procedures booklet with any changes <clears throat> been made to the law and any new systems we have put in place, anything new that the clerks need to know, revising it, updating it, and getting it out to them around the state, right around this time, usually. And I started thinking this weekend that I should be doing that. And then I started thinking that I have what our process is going to be in November. And how would I write that book with a menu of options? And it's, it's really impractical and doesn't make sense. The other thing that I'm doing around this time typically is I'm planning for a series of trainings. Every two years in an election year in the summer, in July, I host uh, seven or eight, usually eight trainings around the state at locations geographically spread out around the state, get 50 or so clerks and um, other election workers, BCA members attending those. And I would be developing the outline for those right now as well in conjunction with updating that procedures booklet um, and planning for holding those and planning for how I walk the clerks through whatever the process is going to be this year. And again, obviously that would be very difficult to do um, without knowing exactly how things are gonna go in November. So those are just a few examples of where the clarity and certainty on a practical level become really important for me. Um, and I will leave it at that and answer any questions. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions right now for Will or Chris? All right, if not, let's jump to Carol. I see Carol Doss is with us. And <clears throat> Carol, I don't know if um, somebody from um, Digger called me the other day about this and they asked for who they should, who else they should talk to. And I suggested Senator Collimore because he's on this committee and has a different um, position. So I thought that would be good. And then you, I don't know if they contacted you or not, but sorry if I. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm, I'm always happy to, to, uh, to talk to any legislator or the press uh, or any member of the public, um, anything to help with uh, education and outreach. So um, okay. I don't I don't have a lot to add from what Chris and Will said. Um, the only thing that I would put out there is is just a couple scenarios that have actually been running through my mind over the last weekend. One of them um, has to do with if, if we don't plan for and proactively move forward with um, mailing ballots out for November, um, I can see there being a, a, a huge uh, influx of requests on the local level that have to be handled on the local level uh, for mailings. Typically, we'll mail uh, five, six, seven hundred, um, and with a voter checklist of fifty-five hundred, I can imagine it being more in the range of two, three thousand. 
Um, and, you know, I've got staff out on furlough, not sure for how long. <clears throat> um, having the staffing ab available to meet that kind of demand um, might be tricky. Um, being able to do the, the mass mailing through the Secretary of State's office would certainly be be helpful and to know that was going to happen would, would uh, provide certainly a, a, a level of, uh, of comfort on our end. Um, the other concern I have, of course, is um, as Chris was talking about um, polling places for November. Um, with any luck, we will be able to accommodate, I mean, we'll have polling places, we have to, but we'll be able to accommodate the usual kinds of numbers, but I don't think that's the, the smart way to plan for it. Um, and if I have uh, my normal turnout, uh, 2,500, 3,000 people. I can imagine being in a circumstance where I have lines where I have to designate people come in one door and out the other, where I have lines on the floor that keep them six feet apart, where I have people standing at the door to only let a few people in at a time, where my polling booths that accommodate four people in those uh, uh, quarter booths uh, can only do one person for social distancing, where everybody has to get a goal pencil so that they're not retouching the writing utensils um, and uh, a polling process that would you know we can do in a 12 hour time frame um, turning into something that that goes hours and hours longer because of the line um, and because of obviously that the care we want to take um, with the public so being able to offer as many different options as possible is our best way to secure, uh, to offer a secure, safe, um, and equitable voting process for November. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I actually do have a question for you. I don't know which of the three of you, Carol, it just um, triggered something when you were talking about the hours and hours that it would take. Even, I mean, even if we did this and people, many people mailed in their ballots ahead of time, you're still gonna have people showing up. Yep. So, and you're still going to have to have them only doing one person at a time in the little carousels or whatever they're called. Is there, do we need to extend the hours? And I think that you can do that, Chris, um, without legislation and will about when the results have to be in because they're, it, it might take longer than um, that to count all the ballots because it'll take longer to vote. Yeah, Will, Will can probably speak to this much more uh, than I can, but one, one piece of the plan would be uh, to understand that there would be additional time needed to count all of those uh, ballots that come in uh, by mail or dropped off or voting early. Um, and that we shouldn't expect, uh, and we're seeing this in other states already, we're not going to be able to expect um, election night results, that it's just going to take longer. We may not know the outcome okay. of elections for a few days after. That's one of the pieces we need. really need to get out, communicate, and educate. <coughs> um, Will, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add to that. I would just add that to your specific question, Senator White, that, that would take... Um, it would take us exercising the authority under the directive to change the current law, which says you could you complete the vote count on the night of the election. Um, and it's okay. really what it is, is it's really a great example of why we need to make this decision now. Um, there, this is the primary decision. There are secondary, tertiary, and whatever the word is for the fourth level decisions that need to be made after that. Um, in all seriousness. And so now we're in a position of it, it webs out from the first decision you make. And right now we're having <clears throat> the entire web. And if we can make one decision, then we move on to those next ones about do we extend past the, the, the usual polling hours? Do we allow processing for 30 days beforehand so that we're better prepared on election day to maybe get some election night results out by eight? Um, uh, that that's those are the secondary decisions that I can't make until we make the first one and start planning for. And I would assume that in making all those decisions, you'll be working with the town clerks <clears throat> for their input. Of course, and I of course. Okay. 
Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Carol, could I ask you um, whether you did a survey of any sort or uh, have a sense generally of how many of the 246 clerks um, are supporting this? We haven't done a formal survey. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, discussion on our list serve and, and all the discussion that I've heard has been in support of um, the, the processes as are, are <coughs> proposed by the Secretary of State's office. Okay. I may be in the strange locale. I have yet to hear from any town clerk in my district that is supporting it. I've heard not that many, three or four that, that don't support it, but I may be in a very different situation. I think I got the same three or four that you did. And those are the only ones I've received. <clears throat> One of the Wyndham County delegation is actually a, a town clerk and we meet pretty regularly and she is very supportive. And this isn't, this. I, I don't see this as a partisan issue. She's an independent. So, and I, I don't see that this is partisan at all. Um, <clears throat> I did hear from Senator Benning that he hasn't heard from any of the town clerks in his district one way or the other. So, any other questions for Will or Chris or Carol? I like the, uh, the concept, Will, of um, <clears throat> a web kind of that all these things have to, or a Venn diagram, which I just learned recently what that meant. I mean, this last year, I didn't even know what it meant until it was in a crossword puzzle that I was doing. <coughs> anyway, any other questions? Okay, let's jump uh, to, well, uh, let me, oh, I, I'm I, sorry, I'm, Anthony. That's okay, Anthony. it's okay, I was hesitant, because I don't really have a question, I just thought, the reason why I thought this meeting today was important was because we've been obviously hearing from Chris and Will that they've been asking us to put this decision off and put it off, give them more time, give them more time, which we've done. So I was really curious as to what they were gonna relay to us today. And clearly the message is very different. To, it, it had been, let's wait and see what we can do. Now it seems to be, we can't do it. We have to move forward with the legislation. So it's, it's not a question, but that's really what I thought this was about. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that in a way because I was getting anxious about the idea of having to make contracts with printers and paper and all that kind of stuff, all the details of the technicalities of carrying through with the kind of election we're talking about doing. So I'm glad that we're gonna finally be able to move forward, at least on our part. The, other, <clears throat> the one other thing that I would um, point out that I heard, and I don't know if it came from the governor or what, but it was, um, <clears throat> that there should be this um, committee that does it because it shouldn't be somebody who's on the ballot that makes the decision. And I would, so I don't know if people want to respond to that when they talk, but I would point out that the short of having the decision made by the uh, Supreme Court justice, everybody, we're all elected. So any, um, and, and if you're appointed by the governor and appointed by the house and appointed by the Senate, you're still, kind of answerable to them. And the people who make elections decisions every time we change them are elected people. It's the Secretary of State's office and the legislature, and we are all elected. So I just wanted to point that out, that that was one of the things, I don't know if it came from the governor, or, um, but it was pointed out to me that, so. <clears throat> and I would say that, um, if I were thinking about this, I think that more, most of the decisions are probably being made by Will and Chris rather than our elected Secretary of State. Yeah, bureaucrats, right? <laughs> hmm? Be big bad bureaucrats. <laughs> but the, 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 the committee idea did come from the governor, right, Chris, or Will? <laughs> Yes, Senator, that's that's correct. That was in the, the latest um, rejection of our proposal was a counter proposal to create a committee, a committee of five to make the decision after the primary. And we just think that's you know beyond what, what you were intending. You wanted to put this decision in the hands of the secretary <coughs> and the governor, uh, one from each party would help make it, um, make sure that it was 
not partisan. That's part of our reluctance to bring it back to the legislature. We really were concerned that that sort of a, a override type situation would make it seem partisan, but it's it's really not. Um, we worked really well with the governor's office on so many things, and even in this, and having some great communication and great discussion, we just can't see eye to eye on uh, this one piece of it, which is making a decision now, which you're hearing from us is, is really important for us to, for all the other pieces to fall in place. So uh, that's why we're here. Paul? <clears throat> uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I, you've heard from me before, so I'll be very brief on this. I have had the opportunity over, uh, uh, a number of years to speak to this committee on many different issues. And I think I would just say, probably the idea of making this upcoming election uh, uh, as safe and secure as it can possibly be for voters and for election officials all across the state, I, I can't think of anything more important um, that your committee uh, could do or will do. And so I appreciate the um, care and the concern that you are showing in, in revisiting this issue now. Um, I think from our perspective, given the possibility for the uh, COVID-19 virus to come back um, in, a, in a threatening way in the fall and, and that being something that we just cannot know for sure uh, now or in August, it does make sense to try to reduce the number of people who are showing up in polling places on election day uh, to the greatest possible degree. And um, it seems pretty clear that the best way to do that is to encourage people to vote safely from home. Um, if you want to ease the way for people to do that, um, we have seen from other states, you mail them the ballot, uh, provide a postage paid return envelope and other means, if they so choose, for them to, um, to uh, uh, drop that off. Um, and that's the way to bump up the numbers. In Vermont, we have something on the order of 95,000 uh, Vermonters who typically might vote early or vote by mail um, before an election. Um, that's a little less than 30% of all registered voters. Um, again, we think that um, the best safest thing this year would be to have a number closer to 300,000 people. So up from 95 to close to 300,000 people choosing to vote early or vote by mail or otherwise avoid the polling places in person on election day. Uh, doesn't mean that you won't have in-person voting on election day, you all know that and, and we agree that that is important, but let's try to keep both voters and poll workers and other election officials as safe as possible by Having, other, having people uh, take advantage of the safest possible alternatives. So I think that's the way to do it. I think that we have seen now thousands of Vermonters signing our petition and others uh, kind of embracing this <coughs> idea. There are dozens of organizations and businesses that are on board um, with this and we appreciate the partnership of those organizations as well. And we and others who are involved in doing public education work or people who are more active in communities or civic organizations, I think are across the board, um, very willing um, and able to help do education, which will also be an important part of this because if, if, if thousands, if tens of thousands of people are voting using this method of voting that they've never used before, uh, it's, not, it's not tremendously difficult, but there are things that you need to do and, and do it correctly. And so we want those things done the right way the first time in order to avoid any possibility of you know, a large number of spoiled ballots or you know, no, none of us would wanna see that kind of thing. So I just wanted to add that element in here. And we've appreciated the communications that we've had with the Secretary of State's office. We, we and, and again, our, our partners and many, many other organizations are, are very willing to continue that effort to work with the Secretary of State and the local clerks to do anything we can to be helpful about that education um, uh, element to this too. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop there and just say, I, I really, again, appreciate your willingness to, to take this up. It really shouldn't be uh, a partisan issue. We all are concerned about making elections safe and secure. And I, I just think this is the best way to do it this year. So <clears throat> I have to admit, I've never voted by an early ballot. I always go to the polls. And <clears throat> is there, when, when, if I get one, is there something on there that says you can mail this 
ballot back to your town clerk. You can take it to your town clerk. You can deposit at the town clerk's office, or you can take it to the polls, or you can show up at the polls. Is there something in there that that clearly identifies that people have those choices? Rather than me answer the question, I think I'll ask uh, Chris or Will okay. to respond to what it says now. Okay, Chris. Maybe I'll defer defer to Will on this, but it will be that's part of our plan is very clear communication on your options. Um, will you want to take this one? Sure. the The current certificate envelope, as it is now, um, really focuses on the procedure to return it by mail, because that's really important um, <clears throat> for them to get right, so that what Paul was talking about, you reduce the number of potential defective ballots because of any issues about putting them properly in the certificate envelopes. In the August primary, it's instructions to return the two unvoted ballots in the other envelope that's provided. So really, the, on the envelopes themselves, because that's what they're for, it's mainly focused on the mail return. But Senator White, I plan um, a cover letter, essentially, an informational cover letter, which will describe all of the options and will make clear that in-person polling is still available also. Great, thank you. Any other <clears throat> questions or anything for Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I remember when we talked about this last week, I'll just ask the question, um, is there anything to prevent an individual who could be a candidate or not, or a group or association from offering to pick up completed ballots and bring them to either the town clerk's office or a polling place or to mail them? Senator Collimore, the current law, I believe, does allow for that. Um, I can send you the language in that section about return of the ballot if you'd like to look at it. Um, to me, it could be more clear. Um, it starts out by saying that the voter shall return the ballot um, by the, as, as prescribed, and then down from that, further down the section, there is what you would consider the prescriptions. And those include some language that, if I'm pulling it off the top of my head, but one of the options is by any means to the town clerk's office. And I think you could read that as saying that one of the prescribed methods that is allowed for a voter to return that voter's ballot is to give it to somebody else as the any means that's described down below in that statute. But I just, I know that in coming up with the directive, one of the things we've been discussing is how we can bring clarity to that issue with, with language in the directive that will make exactly clear what is and isn't okay on return. Allison? Okay. Oh, wait, Brian has a follow-up, I think. No, that's all right. I think I get, the answer is yes, I could go door to door and offer to pick up mm -hmm. people's ballots and bring them to either the town clerk or the mailbox or somewhere else. Yes, and I would add that, you, that there are situations where that is very helpful for folks who are homebound and unable to effectuate the return. There. Okay, I thought there was something at one point where if it were justice of the peace, there had to be two people that would accompany someone to do that. Is that not true? I think that's if you deliver them. That's okay. a separate process where the JPs deliver the ballot to the person, let them vote it, and then bring it back for them. Okay, thank you. Allison? Yes, I, I was just going to go to that exact point, which is um, it, it's a great, uh, actually, it's a great opportunity for many of our assisted living uh, facilities and, and for places where people can't actually physically get back, at, where the, the members of the BCA go and uh, conduct a, a mini election in those facilities and, and bring the ballots and bring them back. And, and sometimes they, they let them mail them back on their own, but it's a, you know, we do allow for other people to bring <clears throat> ballots back. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't see that that's a necessarily a bad thing as, you know, because in those cases, it's very enabling. I think that the, um, the fear comes in with the uh, bad experience that was 
in was it North Carolina last year where um, right. but right. we have if we've had 30% of the people voting early up to this point and I don't think we've had any any examples of that kind of fraud at all so I I wouldn't expect even if we even if we have um, six ninety percent of them voting that's three times if three times zero is still zero so well at, you know while we're on the subject because you know I, I know that this is a concern for some people but perhaps will and Chris could address uh, has there been any voter fraud in Vermont? I mean, my no, we, my we've already decided, we've already heard that. I know, but maybe now while we're having this conversation, okay. and everybody's more attuned to it. Maybe now it's it's best to hear it again because my understanding is there's almost none. Right, and that's why I said zero times three is still zero. I, I know, but I think to allay fears, there is clearly concern there. So uh, if they would just reiterate it, I think that would be helpful in this context. Okay, sure. reiterate. Reiterated. Um, uh, I've been in the Secretary of State's office for over 20 years now. Uh, Secretary Condos, more than 10. Um, Will's been with the office a long time too. And, and we just, we have not seen those complaints of voter fraud. Uh, nothing like we've seen in, in North Carolina. Uh, we've had a lot of votes, a lot of elections, a, a healthy amount of vote by mail. We have, have not seen that. And the other thing that I do want to say is I really appreciate that Governor Scott, in discussing this issue with us, he himself has said voter fraud is not a concern for him, that he knows he thinks it's, it's overblown, that, um, that it doesn't exist in, in significant amounts in, in the state of Vermont, especially. Right. Uh, so, yes, I'll, re I'll reiterate that, that, that um, it's not that we are not concerned about voter fraud. It's that it, we have not seen it happening in the state of Vermont. We're always on the lookout for it. Thank you. I Thank think you. that's helpful for the people. You know, there are more people participating in our committee events now via YouTube than there have been, you know, in our room where you've said it many times. So it's, it's great to hear it much more publicly. Thank you. Is, is Kate with us also? Or Paul, are you, did you speak for Kate also? Right, uh, no no more testimony from BPIRC today, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you, just wanted to, did we hear from any of the um, the parties, the partisan, the political parties? Did any of them respond back? Do we have Terry Anderson or Deb Bilado? Bilado, is that how you say her name, Bilado? or um, Josh Ronsky, are we've any of them with us? We've received no response from any of the parties, Senator. Okay, well, well, like we've said before, we can't make people come and testify. All right, so is Anne Galloway with us? We did not receive any response from the press either. Okay, or Mike Donahue. I guess, or Amy Schollenberg, who I don't know who she was representing. Do you, Paul? But she's not with us, right? <clears throat> okay, so I think that um, if there are no more questions, um, <coughs> are we in a position to um, act on this bill? I hope so. Are you ready for a motion? Oh, yes. Uh, so, does somebody want to make it? Yeah, I'm happy to make it. Um, I would move that we uh, pass out draft 2.1 uh, of the drafting request 20-0989. Uh, I would move that we vote it out favorably. Ready? All right, any questions or comments or anything before we take a vote? No. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Senator Bray. 
Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. No. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Great. Thank you. Motion carries for one. So I assume that the way we have to do this now is we have to, Betsy Ann, you have to get it to drafting operations. And sorry. is that uh, to get a number and everything? Back to. Um, I was just looking back to Secretary Bloomer's email. What I'll do now is I'm going to copy the whole committee um, on this email and send it to both drafting operations and copy Secretary Bloomer and Vanessa and get the ball rolling for that process. Okay. And then you might have, um, looking back to Secretary Bloomer's email, oh, um, he might just follow up with you, Madam Chair, as uh, needing further confirmation of committee okay. approval. Okay, and I, if anybody really wants to um, report this, they're welcome to, otherwise I would love to, so. I think, if you'd, love, so, I think uh, if you'd love to, we don't like to stand in the way when you love to do anything. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> All right, so. Thank you, thank you, Will and Chris and Paul and Carol. Is have been very helpful and um, appreciate all the the good discussions starting probably the very first week we left when we started talking about our <coughs> first emergency COVID bill. So, yeah. thank you. Yeah, the first okay, and you're welcome. The first COVID. What? The first COVID act was what? Act 91? I have no I, idea what acts act are. Act 92, we were right up there with one of the first. Yes, the first one was Act 90, and then the second one was Act 90, or excuse me, Act 91, and the, this, the second one was this one, Act 92. That would be amended. <clears throat> I actually don't really pay any attention to them because it gets very confusing because you have Act 46 of one year is different than Act 46 of the other year, but yet when people talk about Act 46, you know exactly what they mean, even though there was an Act 46 the year before also. So, <clears throat> okay, thank you. And you're certainly welcome to stay with us for the rest of our day. We love to have people with us, but we understand. <laughs> thank you. So I see we're not um, set to go here until 2.30. It's a little bit early. I, I don't know if any of the people, I saw that um, Sheriff Anderson is with us. Um, <clears throat> maybe we can have a little committee discussion um, and then and before people uh, come about what we heard <coughs> last time from the commissioner and I, I will um, start off. If I was, um, first of all, I have a great deal of respect for the commissioner, but the training council and the academy are not under the Department of Public Safety. And the commissioner is one member on the training council. So I, um, looked at a number of the things um, <clears throat> that he suggested that um, one of them was um, not changing the council membership until they got a new director. And Brian was very helpful in making sure that that stayed on the radar. Um, my concern about that is that <clears throat> I think that when they get a new director and the new director starts um, figuring out the direction to go and the things to do, that they need those other voices that we've put on there. So um, that I would not not want to wait until hearing those voices until after everything is decided. And <clears throat> I did have a... Um, uh, question for Betsy Ann about the um, 
the town's planning did, did we say emergency plan i in my mind i had public safety plan i think that's what it was huh you did you called it a public safety plan um oh. we can pull it up um, I have a new a revised draft 6.1 I'll send out, um, but we can look at this current language if you want to check it out. Um, Gail has posted for you draft 5.1 and you can find that um, town public safety planning starting in section 28 at the bottom of page 44. Okay, and wait a minute. It's going to take us a second to get there. No problem. Is, is that posted today, 6.1? Uh, uh, we're still on draft 5.1. I haven't sent out 6.1 yet, but the language for about for this public safety plan would remain the same. Great. And, it and sets, what, what page? That starts at the bottom, page 44. So what this language does is piggyback off of a requirement that towns already have yeah. to analyze their capacity to perform emergency functions during an all hazards event. Um, right now, how we're operating under the governor's um, executive order authority, um, now we're in an all hazards event right now with COVID. So this language is, um, You'll see it's in Title 20, 20 VSA Section 6. That's in our emergency management chapter. Mm -hmm. And in emergency <clears throat> management, towns have to analyze their current capacity and provide their current capacity to handle emergency uh, all hazards events and free them up the food chain. Because as we are going to an emergency situation, we better pretty much operate from top down with people, the, the local organizations chipping in as necessary, depending on what type of all hazards event it is. So if you wanna look at this current law requirement for each town to analyze their own emergency management functions, that's on page 46, starting on line four. But Betsy, Ann, mm. before you go any farther, yeah. we haven't changed anything about the emergency plan except um, capitalize and technical changes we didn't change that at all it already says they have to do it in compliance with the state emergency plan you're absolutely right you're not okay. changing any of the emergency management function whatsoever okay. you're just borrowing off of the work that towns already have to perform um, you can see on page 46 online four it says each local organization and local organization is defined in the chapter it it refers to um it's on a town level. It's referring to people who are in charge, essentially, of emergency management. But it's a current law requirement for each local organization of a town to annually notify the local emergency planning committee of the town's capacity to perform emergency management functions in response to an all hazard event. So towns already annually have to analyze, essentially, what they're capable of doing in responding to an all hazards event. And this new language would borrow or piggyback on that current law duty that they already have to perform annually. So with the understanding that they're already annually analyzing their emergency management function or capacity, this new language starting here on page 46, line 11, borrows or piggy, um, piggybacks off of that, builds off of it um, to create this new public safety plan. Okay. And so it says at the bottom of page 46 on line 18, concurrently with its annual notification required under the subsection D, each local organization will have to an analyze the law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch resources, needs, scarcities, costs, and problems within the municipality and report that information to its legislative body. Then the legislative body would go through a process of soliciting public comment and consulting with other entities that might be able to provide uh, these emergency resources. And then um, 
propose a public safety plan or revisions to an existing public safety plan um, as the public body deems necessary. And then finally adopt one. Um, the section 29 says uh, each town and city would have to have a public safety plan by July 1, 2023. So his, his comments I thought were aimed at the emergency planning because he talked about how the state emergency um, uh, management office is they'll be revising that. And so it's premature to have the towns do it, but we aren't changing anything with the emergency plan at all. We're just requiring them also to do a public safety. Did, did the rest of you feel that way that he was mainly referring to the, the emergency planning as opposed to the public safety planning? I think so. I mean, it was a little unclear to me exactly what he meant at the time, to tell you the truth. He had a lot to say. So, it was, you know, it was, that was just one of the many things that he brought up. But mm -hmm. given what Betsy, what you and Betsy just said, it makes sense whether he meant it that way or not. And I'll just note that this public safety plan, specifically on page 46, um, lines 13 through 15, I didn't say it when, we, when I first started talking. This is about the law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch resources, needs, scarcities, costs, and problems within the municipality unrelated to an all hazards incident. So outside of emergency management. Um, so this is really talking about what a town needs for its own standard, regular um, public safety needs. So non-emergency, not non-emergency though, is that a way, is that an accurate right. way to say it? Un unrelated to an all hazards event. All hazards yeah. event is a defined term in the emergency management chapter. That's what triggers the emergency management chapter. So this public safety plan is unrelated to an all hazards event. So not what a town would have to do in when there's an actual Title 20 emergency, but it's just normal public safety needs. Right. Allison? So, so Betsy, um, um, I'm a little concerned with, uh, help me understand, uh, 46 into 47 on line, um, on line 11 on page 47. Are you referring to this as the annual review of the, of what would become their public safety plan? Are you because I'm a little concerned with the, the words as necessary. We are de deems, deems necessary. Uh, we are determining that every town needs to have a public safety plan. I don't want to, I mean, I'm hoping that we will not have towns coming back and saying, well, we've looked at this and we've deemed that unnecessary. We're just going to continue with the status quo and the status quo is unacceptable, you know, un what we're trying to get away from. So is this referring to the annual review or is this referring to the initial plan? I set that statutory language up on page 47, lines 10 through 13, that subdivision C, that, that right. legislative body needs necess deems necessary. That's what I'm asking I about. Set, I set that up as the annual review. Okay, so this with, is the annual review. With an understanding that the public safety plan will have already been adopted. Got it. Okay. 29 but, that follows makes clear that every town and city has to have adopted a public safety plan by July 1, 2023. Right. And so with the understanding that that will happen by that date, then this statutory language would be there for right. when the town annually looks at it to determine whether there are any necessary changes that needed to be made to it. Thank you. I thought that was the case. I just wanted to. Yeah, good. Talk. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? <clears throat> so the two other things that the commissioner um, talked to us about, well, I have one in my notes here and I have leave and I have a check beside it, but I don't know what it meant to leave it in there, I, what I wanted to leave or what he wanted to leave, but. Or maybe you wanted to leave and get into the garden. <laughs> oh, that, that is true. I tried to um, go out on our deck because I was so jealous of Anthony and Cheryl today in the Senate section and and the sun hits our deck about two o'clock and it's just so hot and um, I couldn't do it. Yeah. But anyway, 
I sat outside for the for the morning session and for the ag committee. I came inside for the afternoon because it was too hot outside. Yeah. You are such a North Country person. <laughs> <laughs> I I agree with you, Anthony. I can't. It gets above eighty and I'm done. Um, mm -hmm. So section thirteen, which is the section that says VCIC should report the. Um, and he talked a lot about the dashboard that they're putting up and how everybody will have access to it and they can manipulate it and everything. Right. So I right. wondered if if that was <clears throat> something that we felt was unnecessary to leave in here now since they are working on that. And um, and so it's not up to VCIC now to, to send it to them, but the, it'll be up there on the dashboard and towns can look at it and say, how many robberies did we have and how many so, yeah, the, the one concern, as you may remember, I, I had about this is that that VLCT, somebody's going to have to take on educating towns about this as a resource, because it, I think it's one of the reasons we had this here was that we were so stunned by towns that had no idea of what was going on. So, well, it was a little more of, difficult in to terms find of the activity. Yeah, oh, Allison, I'm sorry. No. You know what I meant. It was it was a little more difficult to find the information before. I think it was on a website, but it was a little bit more difficult to find. <clears throat> and um, somebody is going to have to educate them. But Betsy Ann. Yes, yeah, so I have in my notes as I was preparing draft six point one that. The committee directed me to remove section 13. Was that correct? Okay. Okay. This, I couldn't remember one if we actually did. Okay. Yes. Good. For draft okay. 6.1, which I couldn't remember if we did or if it's just in my notes. Yeah. <clears throat> and I know this is going to make some people very um, unhappy, including my own sheriff who is with us right now. Um, but I wondered if we should eliminate the section about the retirement and the treasures <clears throat> and instead um, give the, the committee that's been working on um, group C and who belongs and who doesn't belong in the treasurer's office. I'm on that committee um, and give them time because when they finished their work, they were the treasurer um, promised that she would look at how we can better um, put the sheriffs into retirement and maybe other people too. So I, I just, I throw that out um, because <clears throat> it will cause a lot of grief from the treasurer's office and nothing will happen before January. So. Anybody have a taking it out. what? I am fine taking it out. Yeah, me too. I'm okay with it as long as we make because it isn't just the sheriffs. There's a whole bunch of municipal. I mean, it's a big recruiting issue, as I recall. I mean, I can't remember everything about it, but I remember it's a recruiting issue. I remember it's inconsistent between all branches of public safety. So it would be great if there was a consistent. I mean, I hope we're not going to drop the ball on working towards a consistent, equitable way for people to have retirement benefits. Well, <clears throat> if any one of the five of us is here next year, my guess is we won't drop it. Chris? Yeah, I, did I yes, I agree with your take on it. Um, there's a certain world weariness in the way you talk about it that tells me, yes, this is a realistic assessment of what we can get done at the moment. And um, so I agree. And now Chris is speaking to us from the rainforest. Oh, that's the, that's New Haven, Vermont. That's uh, our, our old it's woodlot. Beautiful. It's beautiful. But. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask um, Mark. Um, if you want to weigh in on that, knowing that um, this is a huge concern of yours. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I apologize. My internet has not been the greatest today, so I'm just by audio. I also have a wind tunnel going behind me, so if I need to turn my air conditioner <laughs> off, let me know. Um, it is too warm for me. The uh, I having not spoken with uh, all the sheriffs regarding it. I think we understand that you have a lot going on right now, and uh, while it's uh, discouraging to, uh, to hear it get dropped, it's understandable. Um, we have to come to terms with that. So appreciate you acknowledging our interest uh, and we understand where you're coming from. <clears throat> well, I feel bad because I, and not just for the sheriffs, but I would like to see all law enforcement in the state in the same retirement uh, plan, but that's gonna take a lot more uh, effort. And I think that we have the commitment of the treasurer to try and figure that out and work in that direction anyway. So I, I don't want this bill to get bogged down because of it. So um, we're still way ahead of ourselves here. I don't know where. So who do, do we have? No. I see that. Um, uh, so sorry, what section was that, Jeanette, the, the retirement section? section i don't remember i don't either but betsy ann will find it do we have chris brickell or mad birmingham or george merkel uh mike Sherling, dan batesy bill boniak win zakoff and I did see Drew here earlier. Our two guests in the room at the moment are Sheriff Mark Anderson and Drew Hazelton. And the others aren't on yet, but Madam Chair, if you would like to take a break, uh, the committee can always do that as well. Oh, that, the committee would, would, that, that would be lovely. Would you like to take a 10 minute break? What would we do? That's unheard of. I, I'm sorry. I. I I'm usually such a slave driver that I don't let people take breaks, but um, we can do that. I want to ask a, a totally random question though before that. It's not sure. totally random and it might be mostly for Betsy, I'm not sure, but it has to do with how we turn in the bills that we want to get under the calendar. I know we've had back and so I have a bill in for, I have um, um, 948, which you know, H948, the one with the, um, about the quasi-judicial proceedings, et cetera. So I have a version of it that says draft number 2.1. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the one I'm supposed to send in or whether I'm supposed to be waiting for something different. It yeah, I, I have the same question. I don't know. Like, is, that, is that a question? Was that the version that the committee ultimately voted out? Yes. Yes. And, no, and the, think, the email from Tucker says, attached, please find draft 2.1 of the H948 amendment, subsection B has been removed, and the remaining subsection is re-lettered. So he's saying, please find this draft. And you know, it, it is the one we approved. So it, it says the to, top draft number 2.1, you know, something about it does make me feel like it's, I'm not sure if it's the official one or not. Oh, uh, well, so was he sending that to the Senate secretary's office or was that- No, just he's just sending it to hmm. us, to the committee. Okay. so the. Whatever the official version is, if uh, if that was the version that was voted out of committee, then the reporter of the bill needs to submit that to the Senate Secretary's office. So that would be Secretary Bloomer and Vanessa. Okay. But what is this with the op drafting operations? So I, I get can, very confused. Yeah, I, yeah. Can, I, I confirmed I that question. with um, Nadine this morning. So that process where drafting ops gets involved is only necessary when it's a committee bill. For example, right now you just voted out that elections committee bill. So I'm about to hit send on an email to legislative council drafting operations staff, which oh. is Nadine heads that. I'm gonna copy all of you, copy Gail, copy secretary Bloomer and copy Vanessa and say, this is the bill, the committee bill that they just voted out Drafting ops, please process it. Secretary's office, here it is, get ready for it. Please let Senator White know what else needs to be done so for you to confirm that you're introducing this. Um, but that LC drafting ops only has to get involved when it's a committee bill. I think it, when it's a, a committee amendment to an existing bill, 
It's just that the reporter of the bill needs to submit it, submit the version that was voted out of committee to the Senate Secretary's office. Drafting ops doesn't have to get involved with that one. Okay, Brian. So Betsy, the bill that we drafted, um, let me open the other page, H793, which was the um, uh, uh, auditor's um, change. You sent it to me, but I didn't do anything more with it. Am I in error? Uh, yeah, that, well, I, I, that needs to get to the Senate Secretary's office to vote it okay. out favorably. To show, so that they know that it got voted out favorably. Okay. Um, so if you if you want, <clears throat> I can send that email to the Senate Secretary's office and copy all of you, um, and let them know that you'll be the reporter. Are you reporting that one, Senator? Yes. Collimore? Okay. But I, I think he's just going to follow up with you to say, "All right, Senator Collimore, please confirm." <laughs> that. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, just to make sure that it's in the hopper. Yeah, because I have that we have seven bills here that we haven't, um, that kind of we've passed, uh -huh. but they, well, eight now with the elections one we just passed and they're kind of in limbo and I wasn't sure how to, so uh, no. <clears throat> if it's, if it's an H bill that came to us, which all of these are, Mm -hmm. We just have to, once we vote it out, we just have to send it to the secretary's office. Yeah, just try to okay. consider it. I th I've been trying to just think of it as doing the same thing you normally would, but just electronically. So normally when the committee, when you vote out a bill, whether it's an H bill or an S bill with amendment, you have to walk that amendment up to the secretary's office or he comes down to get it from you. Um, and staff isn't allowed to do it. So uh, that's so I, that's why I would say just send to his office, whatever you're voting out. Um, but I, I can do that now with the auditor's bill, but he'll just do a follow up to uh, make sure that you agree with that. And so that's why I also did that with the S33 <coughs> amendment. I just uh, noticed that it wasn't on there. And um, how important is it that I remember what the, when, when we voted it out? The date? I don't Pretty well, important. Uh, Sarah Clarkson might have the record, but uh, I don't. I've mailed it to okay. Gail. I don't think the date is as important as the committee vote. Sure, they're going to want to know the committee vote. Sure, um, but I don't. I don't think the date matters. The because committee vote on every on the calendar. The committee vote on everything so far has been five zero until this uh, draft two point one. So who's the reporting vote, five? The, the vote, the vote oh, was the, ahead, the day after we went to the rules committee meeting. Yeah. That was the date you took your husband for the cataracts. Oh, so that would have been last Thursday. Okay. So who's reporting 558? I don't even know what uh, that I, one is. I, it's the victim, the, the, uh, the victim the, compensation the center board for uh, crime victims. That's okay. And you're, are you reporting that Allison? Yeah, but I, I don't know where the bill is. I think Tucker has it. I don't know. I, 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 I'll check and see if Tucker sent it to me and I then send it to Bloomer, right? Yes, because we made an amendment. We made an amendment and I don't, so it, it and we did decided to do it as a strike all. So uh, anyway, I'll be in touch okay. with Tucker. And it's 558, five, right? Huh? It's 558. Five, yeah. Yes. And yeah. Who's I, he did he did email it to us on May twentieth, so you might be able to find it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, and so that's the the fix the final version. And so then I send that to Bloomer, and then with five five four, uh, it's also with Tucker. So I'll uh, that I, I I think that's ready to go too. And who's reporting seven eighty eight? It's me. That's you. So Which one all, is that? That That's was the technical corrections bill. <laughs> right. The uh, we have a we have a one page amendment. You're gonna serve coffee with that one, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll be serving coffee with that because you know there's nothing more important than we're a nation of laws. So I want to read this one completely. Yeah. To to the room. <laughs> is um, that the 255 page bill? 
Yes, ma'am. Now 256, yeah. we're adding one more. Uh, so we have a one-page amendment to a 255-page bill. Um, but I haven't, re I've looked in email. I don't have an official copy of our amendment that I, well, I'm, I'm thinking what I need is an official copy of the amendment. We did get one from Jen and we voted it with no changes. So I suppose I could use that. What was the number of that one again? 788. Um, and she sent it to the committee. Um, I just want to make sure that it's, you know, that it is that we voted draft 1.1 1 .1 of 788 uh, and it's dated 512. Okay, three, at 534 p.m. Yes, ma'am. So yes. I think that is the one we voted because I remember one, two, three. Um, three instances of amendment. Yes. Okay. So I could forward that to Senator, uh, Senator Secretary Bloomer. And I guess, does that mean that all these things are going to arrive there and then they're going to process and automatically go to the rules committee, at which point you, Madam no, Chair, will get them They out. don't have to go to rules. We've already been there for oh. these bills. Okay. We've they're, been eagerly there. The, they're eagerly awaiting the technical corrections bill. Uh -huh. Well, a lot of people are. People ask me about that all the time when I'm out walking the dogs. When <laughs> is that coming up? I want to get on that YouTube session. Uh, it's a premium on Zoom tickets. Uh, <laughs> really. So, so who's that doing one's also seven posted on your webpage? But Gail, whenever you're able, if you could label that one also as the version recommended by Senate GovOps, that's 788 one. I have one posted that is recommended, and I'm trying to send it to Senator Gray. It's so. just, uh, they get that official label as recommended by Senate Committee on Government Operations. And that's just, uh, it's not, I don't see it labeled online yet, just so um, if they need to reach it that way. It is on there. So I'll just need to see where, where it's listed or where it's posted. And who's doing 750? What's that? Anybody? Anybody remember that one? What is it? I don't know. Maybe it's me. Um, oh. oh, that's the National Guard provost position. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, I think I'm doing Brian, that one. You no, are? I think, I think so, yeah. Okay. I'll see, if I, I'll see if I have a final version. That's 750? Yeah, and there we made no changes. Okay. So Betsy Ann, just for me, uh, so that I don't forward the wrong one to Secretary Bloomer, um, you're saying there is a, is the head, you know, what, the leading language going to change after we approve the amendment? Uh, it, it shouldn't change if for that, so the, for that one was 788, I'll get back into that one. Sorry, I'm just but no, okay. no, no problem at all. Um, so. Senator Bray, I just sent you a copy of the as recommended version. Okay. You can look for it in your email. And if and anybody then, else who's reporting needs one of those, please let me know and I'll just send you the as recommended version. Well, I think I need 438 and the um, amendments that came from Betsy and Jen, right? Yeah, that, so 438 will need to be turned in. Mm -hmm. so that'll be Jen's amendment. Okay. So now I'm comparing the two. What Jen sent us and what Gail just sent me are identical. So good to go. Thank you. Good. So oftentimes there are two of the same. One is the one that you've taken up in committee and it's posted for that day's discussion. And then once you voted it, <coughs> then I post a second that's called as recommended by. Okay. And Betsy Ann, as far as that goes, I can do that, right? I don't have to wait till I get a copy back from the attorney. Yes, I, I think procedurally, as soon as the committee votes it out, it can be posted as a version 
as recommended because the committee will have already had the document. Right. Unless there was like, oh, we, the committee approves it with, you know, a spelling error corrected and the attorney just needs to resend it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is it just the issue that I had, I'd seen, it usually gets that official label and maybe it's somehow showing up in your system, but I just, I'm not seeing it labeled that way on the committee webpage. So maybe, maybe there's some sort of technical issue with the labeling. I'll look into that. The draft of 124 that we have. Did you, um, I need to refresh, right, so that I can get that one? Um, I got you a message about Ken Sturm. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have a new draft up? We do not, Senator. Okay. There are a couple of people waiting. And did we lose Senator Bray? Oh, no, there he is. Still here. Okay. So I guess um, we had a little conversation um, while we, before, well, we were kind of waiting and um, about what we heard, yeah, uh, whatever day that was from the commissioner. And um, <clears throat> I don't know how the rest of the committee feels, um, but what I'd like to do, I guess, is go through them now and just make sure that we're okay. We don't have to have an in-depth discussion of them unless there's some issues. So let's look at section, Two, section one is just a technical section. Oh, did you just post it? Still working on it, Senator. Okay, so sen section two is the makeup of the council membership. And we heard from the commissioner as one member of the council that he felt that we shouldn't do that until there was a new director and they knew the direction they were going. My personal feeling is that with a new director and looking at the future of the academy and how to, how to, where to go, that is, it is important to have those voices in the mix going forward. So committee, where are the rest of you on that? So, are, yeah, Brian. are you suggesting we just leave what we have in place? That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I think I'm fine with that. Allison? Yes. I, I, I'm also fine. I thought we did good work on this. And my only question has been, has um, the chief, uh, Capitol Police chief been in touch with you? That's the LEAB board. That is not this board. Okay. Um, Chris, did you have a question or were you scratching your head? That was a, a scratch there. Okay. So um, we'll leave sec section two in there and section three. Okay. Yes. Okay, section four is uh, re really is related to um, that, right? It just, I, it talks about um, additional, about certification for um, alternative routes and for um, coming up with um, two, level two to level three. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to look at it now. We've been dealing with this bills for so long, I forget it. Okay. Right, Betsy, section four is. It, it, section four is powers of the council. Yeah. Yes, so this section four in uh, subdivision A1 there on lines 10, starting on line 10, um, requires the council to adopt rules 
to identify and implement alternate routes to certification aside from training at the academy. And um, there is a future effective date. That was one tweak that was made to this requirement. Um, you, I had, had in my notes that you extended that rule adoption deadline to be July 1, 2023 rather than July 1, 2021. And you can find that on at the top of page seven where that change was made about the rule adoption deadline for that, the alternate routes to certification. Is that what everybody remembers? And are we okay with that? Chris? Sorry. I'm flipping back and forth between reading it and the, the other screen. Yes. That's why you have to have two different things going here. I can't yeah. do it on one. Allison, are you okay with that? Absolutely. So I think that um, maybe Mark Anderson is the only um, council member with us. Um, I would ask you if you would comment on the leaving what we've just talked about leaving it as the bill is. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've heard absolutely nothing uh, counter to, uh, to any changes of that section. Um, I think everybody I've heard from has supported it. Uh, I do want to say I'm not speaking on behalf of the council of just myself as mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know the commissioner's reasoning for wanting to do that. Uh, however, um, since I don't know his reasoning, I, I don't have any change in opinion. I think leaving it alone is uh, probably okay. most sense. Thank you. Okay, so the next section is generally after section four is gen section five. Madam Chair, can I mention, oh, you do have uh, that other thing in section five um, about transitioning from level two to level three. Mm -hmm. um, we still, I had in my notes that you wanted to leave that deadline as July 1, 2021. So that's still the deadline um, at the top of page six. And I think we heard from Chris Brickell that they were, they really were working very hard on that anyway. And that in, um, if they come back and say, they just can't do it by then, we say, we extend it. Is that what we heard, committee? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. Then section six. Oh, this is the one that we decided, we just decided to take out. Uh, section six specifically is the report back from the council. Oh. To the right. GovOps committees on how things are going. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, and so the main yeah. change here was the one at the top of page seven to yeah. say that the alternate routes to certification deadline is July 1, 2023. Yeah, okay. So section seven. Additional training. Oh, this allows one agency to train another agency. Right. Any comments on that? Keep it in. Okay. Section eight. And you had a change on this one. I think I'm not looking at the right one yet. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at 5.1. It's got all the different colors, right? That's, yeah. that's all we have at the moment, I think. Okay. Uh, Gail, all right. That's Gail what I'm looking at, too, then. Up, uh, 6 .1. Thank you, Gail. I sent that during the break, so there wasn't a lot of time to post that. So, But she did post 6.1. If you just want to refresh your web page, you'll oh, be able to that see it. Go to? That's better than 5.1? Yeah. yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen any changes yet between five and six, but, um, but we will. that's the most recent one. Oh, okay. it's by magic. Refresh. I mean, no wonder humans are getting so spoiled. It, I mean, that was literally a second and there was 6.1. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. Well, um, it was a second for us. It wasn't for Betsy Ann and Gail. <sighs> I know that. 
so this one was just some uh, tweaks. I saw some places where that needed just a, some cleanup, but it doesn't change the overall um, proposal here, which would be a duty to contact an officer's current agency. Right. Okay. Are we okay with that? Yes. Okay. So section nine. And that's just the um, corresponding language that says that that requirement to contact the current agency doesn't apply if there's an existing non-disclosure agreement that prohibits it just in case. So that's eight and nine are related. Mm -hmm. And 10 is where I believe you've made a change. Yes, yeah, so 10 we get into um, unprofessional conduct and there is one change from what you re reviewed last time, you'll see that on page 11, uh, line 19. This is in regard to the requirement um, for an agency to report allegations uh, that an officer at the agency committed category B conduct. The current language says that an agency only has to report allegations of category B conduct if the executive officer of the agency deems it credible as a result of a valid investigation. So it'd be only after a valid investigation that the agency would need to report those allegations. The original proposal was to say that the agency needs to tell the council when the agency receives a complaint that an officer committed category B conduct. And then with some follow-up from the commissioner and thereafter the chief on the council, um, the change here is to add the agency a credible complaint that the officer committed category B conduct, which is always and I think an allegation because only the council itself can determine whether an officer committed category A or category B because it was it, it would be a finding of unprofessional conduct. <clears throat> and I believe that that um, agreement came from the academy and from um, the commissioner. Brian? I see the commissioner has joined us. I'm trying to recall which section uh, Michael Sherling objected to in terms of an unproven allegation. Is that this section? Yes. yes. Okay. And I believe that the commissioner and um, the chief both agreed that this solved that issue. Right. Am I right about that, commissioner? Yes, adding uh, the, the credible language does give it a higher bar that makes, uh, makes it easier to operationalize. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that was, what section was that, 10? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, the... <clears throat> Section 11, we decided to uh, take out, even though we, it is something we want to pursue. It's just too complicated now, the way we have to operate. I believe the retirement division, uh, representatives of the retirement division are here on the line. You are correct. Okay. I just... So um, is Ashlyn with us? Oh, Tim and Erica, did you see that we've removed that section? Which um, Tim? Tim, Tim Duggan oh, right. and Erica Wolfing are with us. So if um, we have removed that, um, does that make you happier? It's not going away though forever. It's just no. going to this bill. So you won't be happy fully. Okay. Well, I'm not hearing anything from either of them. Even Apparently they they're there. so shocked they're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on to section 12, which now would become section 11, I believe. 
or it doesn't have to be, but okay. This is the requirement for VCIC to establish definitions that are uniform for all officers to use when entering crime data into their uh, system of record keeping, be it Spillman or Valcor. Right, good. Any comments? Definitely needed. Okay. Moving on. But based on your feedback, um, I on page 15, uh, the prior section 13 would be removed. This was the requirement for VCIC to send the quarterly um, updates to towns without a police department describing the nature of the crimes alleged to have been committed in the town in the preceding quarter. And I think we heard from the commissioner that they're doing a a dashboard that will be very easy for towns to look up the information and actually see it the way they want to see it. If they want to see how many burglaries or how many domestics or in their in their surrounding town in their towns. So um, I think we can remove this. Is everybody okay? Okay, Brian. Yep. Yep. Okay, Commissioner, did you want to comment on that or just to agree with us? <laughs> Nothing further to add, Madam Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, may I go yes. back? Because the commissioner did have a concern about uh, our section 12, soon to be section 11, on um, the VCIC um, stuff. And um, Michael, I think you said you were concerned this didn't need legislation. Um, but, you know, they would just do this automatically. It is work that uh, yeah. the director is uh, already has underway and uh, will also be obviated by the, the new um, data system if we're successful in getting one st stood up. I think this was one of the places where um, Senator Colin Moore used the term gentle nudge. It's just right. saying we, we, we know it's happening, but we just want to make sure you move forward. I don't think we have any, um, we do understand that it's happening. Yeah, and that it Under needs to happen. And that's, uh, this is our, we're keeping it in as a gentle nudge, right? Okay, great. Un understood. Okay. Okay, so section 13. Now 14, the LEAB board. Yeah. So most of this so, is just recodifying LEAB. Oh, sorry. And the proposal is to add the director of enforcement and safety at DMV. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is where the Capitol chief, police chief would like to testify. I believe. Okay. Is he here? I don't know. I'll have to look and see if I got anything from him about this. We sent him an you, he sent us an email last week. When he discussed. I can, I'll text him now. I had not heard anything about this, so he has not been invited. So my apologies. Uh, it, uh, Gail, would it be easy for you to invite him quickly? I, I can send him an email. That would be great. Okay. Here's what he said. It was the LEAB committee we were talking about. That said, if you ever see DMV enforcement, game wardens, and liquor and lottery somewhere, and we aren't, it would bear consideration to add us. The four small state law enforcement agencies with unique missions often get left out. Right. That was. I'm okay just putting it in committee what 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 did you say Jeanette I said I'm okay just putting him in yeah me too okay Brian I guess so that would mean there's 18 people on this board um, I guess with the zoom meetings that wouldn't necessarily be too bad but it might be uh, a little cumbersome in person 
I think often they, they divide themselves up into working groups also. Okay. But sadly we have bigger boards than this. Oh, I will I was uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was chair of the United Way board here and there were 24 and it worked really well. But so Anthony. Fine. Chris. Uh, I I think it's right. It's a big board at this point, excluding any one person. Uh, I'd rather round in the favor of adding a voice than having someone uh, potentially important or a new voice at the table left out. Okay. All right. Let's just do it. Okay. I just texted him. <laughs> and so that will, that will change the quorum. I'll be sure to change the quorum then on page 18, line two to be 10 members. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Now we're at section 16. That is um, just goes along with yeah. the codification. Yeah. Yeah. 17 at the top of page 19 is the more substantive one to require that it be to report in 2021 on how town. You just went on to mute for some reason, Betsy Ann. Oh, sorry. I, um, the substantive provision in regard to the LEAB is at the top of 19 and section 17 to require mm -hmm. the LEAB to report in 2021 about how towns can increase access to law enforcement services. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, may I ask a question? Yes. How are we envisioning that with our uh, expand our our uh, our public safety planning, our, our public safety um, plan, and our regional uh, our our regional public safety uh, pilots? How are we when we say that you know that ways that towns can increase access to law enforcement services. How are we hoping to integrate that um, hope with the other two pieces of work we're doing to try and ensure this? I, I would say that the uh, towns are being asked to do a public safety plan. The LEAB might, be, might come up with um, ways for them to have better access that would help them inform, help town, help inform towns about how to do a plan. And um, the LEAB has a member of the LCT on it. So, so do you see this as sort of technical support to the planning process on public safety and the regional uh, public safety pilots? No, this is a I volunteer think. board that um, makes, it's an advisory board. It makes recommendations for things like, uh, here, here's some options around dispatch. Here's some options around how towns can get better access. It does not, it has no authority at all. Okay, I just, where I see those words, and I know we have two initiatives trying to improve towns and public safety. I'm just trying to figure out how they integrate and how they can work together. But I guess maybe through VLCT's efforts to let them all know that all these options exist. Okay. I was just trying. Anyway. Okay. Are we okay with that section 18? Yeah. I mean, section 17? Uh, Betsy had her hand up. Oh, Betsy Ann, I'm sorry. Oh, I just see that the chief of the Capitol Police is here. If you want to take his testimony on LEAB. Oh, we just cut him out <laughs> of that. We were going to put him in the <laughs> LEAB. And then we decided since he wasn't here and he obviously was dissing us, he was out. Works for me. We put you in. Oh, God. Um, okay, thank you. I think. 
Well, uh, you be careful what you ask for. Well, the, the when I was speaking with Senator Clarkson about it, and um, I'll I'll do respect to the commissioner. I see him on. Um, you know, some sometimes our um, our needs don't necessarily match up with um, the needs of that that get represented there. So, uh, any any time that I see DMV and uh, Fish and Wildlife and Liquor and Lottery represented somewhere that we're not, I I wonder why, because we we're much like them. We we're that small state agency with other you know sometimes with with priorities that don't necessarily match up. So. Commissioner, did you want? I see you uh, unmuted yourself. Mr. Shirley, I, I that's would, not a shot at y'all, by the way. Just, no, no, not none, none taken, Chief. Uh, I was I unmuted myself only uh, if the opportunity presented itself. I'd be remiss if I didn't say you go back 50 years and all the studies that say we ought to just be one agency lumped together so that we don't miss all those opportunities to ensure that we're aligned in effort and investment and everything else so thanks for letting me throw that on the table thank you thank you if you hadn't said it i might have now, and i'm i definitely don't oppose that either i mean the last um i know this is not the topic for today but all the studies that i've read since i've taken this job have have recommended the uniting of a single entity in the complex so i mean it's it, it matches everything that we've got well, locally too so we, how about a united entity for the state Ugh. No, you couldn't have a united entity for the state unless you had the state police taking over all local law enforcement. I mean, well, that's, that's that's a different issue. If we, I'm not ready to go there. I am ready to go to having all yeah. state employed law enforcement officers in the same. Yes, but I not in this bill. We've tried it before. <laughs> okay. So, so you're in chief. Um, okay, so we are now on um, section 18. 18. And this um, is the um, dispatch and we changed Betsy Ann, do you want to just tell us what we changed here? All right. So if you want to look at page 20, mm -hmm. um, this would still require DPS to adopt rules that set forth the rates it charges for dispatch. And I added in, I, I believe, based on the um, discussion with the commissioner and with the committee, I believe my notes indicated that you might want to specify that the rules can say that it'd be a future date on which the department would implement those rates. I don't know if I uh, understood that correctly or if you wanted to add that language, but I did add that there on line seven through nine of page 20. Did you wanna add that or should I remove that language? Uh, I'm commissioner. Apologies, I have uh, multiple things going at the same time. Uh -huh. Which uh, section are we? Uh, We're on page 20. Yeah, sorry. Now we're 18. we're on that. Um, we're on a dra new draft six point one. I don't know if you're able to access that, um, on the committee webpage. But this was about the DPS rates for dispatch. Give me uh just a minute to try to find the new draft, and I'll come back to you in a second. Okay. Well, what I did remove here while the commissioner is looking at that, while you all are looking at page twenty. Um, I did remove the language that would require DPS to have rules regulating the technical and operational standards that would apply to any entity performing dispatch functions. Yep. So my notes indicated you wanted to remove that. That was what we decided, right, committee? Yes. Okay. Chris is in such a forest there that he is losing. He's off there in La La Land. La La Land, Bristol. <laughs> I've heard, I've often heard that Bristol is La La Land. <laughs> really? Now you tell me, we just moved here last uh, fall. I know, that's when it became La La Land. Oh, I see. <laughs>
yeah i don't i don't know that we need to put that in because the rules would i would think have to do how they're going to implement it might be better to say how they'll be set forth the rules for dispatch functions and the implementation of them because that's what we want is for the department to come up with rules around how how they arrived at them and when they're going to implement them that sounds more eloquent yes i was just uh based on your conversation before i was concerned that it was the statute might at least imply to some who read it that when the rules were adopted those had to be the rates but i that need, had to apply at that time but I, I i thought i heard from your conversation with the commissioner that they might adopt the rules but then implement those specific rates at a later time on a yeah on a kind of a progressive manner i think this is what he said like uh, uh brian did you have your hand up yeah i did thank you madam chair i remember that exactly as betsy Ann described that it's a, in essence a two-step process that um they can adopt the rule or the rates and then decide at some future date the way it is that those will be effective at whatever date they pick. So I, I do see a little bit of a distinction. I reviewed the language, Madam Chair. I, I don't see any uh, issues. It, it appears to parallel what we're working on now. Then let's just leave it as it is here. Is there a manner of implementation? Would that be capture more for you? How you would want to implement those rates? Shall specify a manner of in implementation, or is that too loose? You know, uh, no. I think I, under the circumstances, I think that makes sense uh, because we'll have to engage uh, municipalities yeah. in particular uh, as we get a better sense of the financial picture going forward and what. Uh, what a reasonable timeline is, is going to look like. Yeah, I think that's fine. Which version? I'm sorry. I'm the one that you have here, I think, is on the fine. page. On the page. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Just wanted to confirm. Thank you. OK. Was uh, there anything else until section 19? Section 19 is just um, technical correction now that you've removed the requirement to have operational and technical standards. It's just removing reference to those here on page 22, section 19. Mm -hmm. But section, no. the one that follows is my very rough, first rough draft of what you did discuss in regard to technical and operational dispatch standards to have those um, four entities, the LEAB, the Fire Service Training Council, the EMS Advisory Committee, and BLCT uh, recommend how best to address standards for dispatch and the entity that should adopt rules providing those standards. So this is just the first draft of that language to see if that um, is along the lines of what you were, you had in mind. Just so the committee is aware, Madam Chair, there is a, a national uh, body that issues standards around emergency communications, APCO. So those exist uh, already. Oh. <clears throat> so we might not even need this? Uh, conceivably. I, I'm not aware of, a, of an issue um, relative to the standards of operation that's emerged. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't one. It just it hasn't crossed my desk. Um, and I think most folks operate based on the APCO standards to the greatest extent possible, to the, to the extent that they're applicable to our operations in Vermont. Mark, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with the commissioner. Uh, originally, I opposed having the rule setting at all, uh, but if I wasn't aware of the reason for adding it in in the first place. Okay. All right, let's just take that out. Committee? Brian? Anthony? Chris? Uh, yes, let's remove it. Allison? 
Uh, I guess. I mean, unless it's worth keeping as a agent as as Senator Collimore says, as a gentle nudge to make sure it continues. I mean that it actually happens. But he sold us that there already is a. a board. Oh, that it already. I thought national, it said it was happen. It was in the works. No, no, a so national I, board that got sets it. standards. Fine. Then if that exists, let's do it. Okay. Okay. I'll remove that section. Okay. Now we get to emergency medical services. Um, and we've uh, switched the State Department of uh, the State Board of Health to the Department of Health everywhere. And I think that that's all been agreed on by everybody. Am I right, Dan, Andrew? Okay. And um, I see Dan nodding. Drew, are you nodding? Okay. That takes us down to page 25, I believe, where the only other changes, and that's, uh, we repealed that. Is there anything in here that's substantively different than what we um, did before? So you, um, at the top of page 26 is just a reminder of that new requirement for when ambulance, uh, an ambulance service wants to become licensed, they have to do so in a manner that's not discriminatory, that mm -hmm. anti cherry picking language. So there's just a reminder to the Department of Health that that language appears on page 26. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lingering question is what the implementation date would be for this and for other Department of Health duties that would be um, required by this bill. So I, I think where I've left it now is just to flag um, these requirements that would be imposed on the Department of Health to um, get a better understanding of what the Department of Health's capacity would be to take them on. Because right now um, this <laughs> This language on page 26 would require Department of Health to adopt rules about these new ambulance license requirements. And so one question would be, um, when does Department of Health have the capacity to adopt those rules? Dan? So I think the, the, the challenge is gonna be that there's a number of different bits and pieces of this bill that I think we'll probably want to talk a little bit about as we get further down the line here. Um, are you asking me for a blanket date right now or you do you want to have more conversations about those other parts? I am hoping that we will have no more conversations uh, that as we go through it we can just make decisions and make changes because if we're going to get this passed this year yeah. Um, we have to we have to get it out of here, and I'm hoping to have it out of here um, no later than Thursday. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's entirely possible to do that. I, I think the only challenge is that um, we have a couple of different dates for, um, for example, with the instructor coordinator issues and with the new licenses. Those are going to be a little bit different in terms of how easy they are to implement. So I'd almost rather answer that question after we've gone through those last bits and pieces and come back to you. But I think it's doable. I just, I'm not uh, in my head. I, I wanna make sure that we're giving you a date that's gonna be in, encompassing of all of those elements. Okay. So when, <clears throat> when we get to the implementation dates, if you'll comment on all of them then so that we can, okay. All right. Any does anything else in there in this section stand up? We have changed on page 27 from the uh, one, one year to three years. Yes. Some of this is reflective of what was done in 182 or whatever yeah. that bill was. Exactly. So one of the things um, that so 
Thank you, Madam Chair. On page 27, that section 2683 about ambulance license terms. So S-182 uh, is now law, changed the license terms from one to three years. So what I'm showing here is um, just showing what the language of the law currently looks like. But what would still need to change here is that it's the Department of Health that issues those ambulance licenses rather than the state board because S-182 didn't make that change from state board to Department of Health. So just okay. keep in mind that it would now be the Department of Health that issues the licenses. All right, any questions, Drew? And I think we talked about it. Is there an appeal to the state board if the uh, license is either denied or revoked or suspended. What does that I, appeal process look like? I think Dan told us that there is a process right now and it would stay the same. It's Am a, I right? a, an appeal to the commissioner's office, uh, the way it's currently in rule right now. So uh, the original decision would be made by the EMS group and then the appeal would be made at the commissioner's level. And that's the way it is now? That's the way it is now, yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. It's it's the way it is now is it's made uh, by the Board of Health and then appealed to the commissioner's yeah, office. But it's still the appeal but is to the commissioner. Functionally, it would be the same. Yeah. So is Any that, question? Is that a Drew? hearing type process where evidence could be given and you know questions can be answered? Yes. This is a decision being made? Yes. Any questions, Allison? Dan, how frequently does that happen? Almost never. Uh, I've been here yeah. just shy of five years now, and it's happened once. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is most licensure applications are, are, are pretty straightforward and uh, are abundantly vetted before they even hit a decision point. So uh, with the exception of one controversial agency that came in that sort of didn't fit in the normal, the, the normal practice uh, model, uh, we've never had a, uh, at least I've never had an issue. Uh, however, I think Drew's got a good point though, to be ready for one that does come up. And, and I think that process is in place. Okay, thank you. All right, so page 20, uh, Thank seven yep. and i just Where? wanted to uh just for drew's reference i, I just did find it and it's uh in ems rule 14.4 in regard to appeals so thanks just wanted to point that out thank you dan um at the bottom of page 27 of the bill is just striking out the language about dfr and forcing directly the um health insurer direct reimbursement because that was taken care of in s-182 and that was a permanent change was it or was it that is correct okay just wanted to check yeah okay section 21 section 21 is about the hrap addressing emergency medical services resources and needs that are identified yep. by the ems advisory committee okay on page 30 you'll see section 22 removed because that relates to that DFR enforcement that's already addressed in S 182. Yep. Uh, on page 31, you'll also see some cross out language in red that was um, because that was addressed in S 182. But what you will see is starting on page 31 and yellow highlighting is language to correct S 182. Um, where S-182 removed reference to credentialing, some of those amendments could have been read so that to eliminate the current requirement that a person can only practice as EMS personnel if they're affiliated with an affiliated agency. So Dan, this is a language I had sent to you when I thinking it was gonna get put on another bill, but here it would show up in this bill. Um, starting on page 31 um, would be, it's related to that requirement that people who are affiliated with an affiliated agency and the licensed um, are hereby authorized to essentially act as EMS personnel. 
because the main idea is, as I understand it, in EMS licensure is you just you can't get licensed and go hang out a, sh a shingle to practice as a EMT, for example, solo practice. You have to be affiliated with an affiliated agency to do so. So this is just uh, correcting language to ensure that that is uh, that requirement is maintained. Dan. I, I think that's great and it does exactly what you needed to. I think the only thing is I'm not sure what an affiliated agency is. Uh, do you mean a licensed agency? Yeah, so affiliated agency is a defined term in Title 24 and okay. that is your first responder services or ambulance services. Okay. It's also defined to include a hospital. Okay, that's fine. That, yeah, the Title 18 EMS chapter uses the definitions in Title 24 um, that regulates ambulance services. And so that's a defined term in there. Okay. Um, we've taken out some little three dot things. On page 32 is the requirement for the Department of Health to establish by rule at least three levels of EMS instructor, instructors and in the education required for each level. And what I would ask, I guess, Dan, if you would look at all of those requirements and come with some, <laughs> sorry about that, and come with some um, recommendations for times so that we can um, deal with them. Okay. Okay. And so just to confirm also what I'm doing, what, what the way that I structured this at the bottom of page 32, started going on to page 33, where, there, where it's that red highlighting, it's not actually removing the language, it's just not showing it. It's not, it's not necessary to show it. So it's not like that language would be removed. What is already removed on page 33, lines six through 14, that's the main credentialing requirement and S-182 eliminated that. So it's just getting rid of un, like not showing in the bill language that's just not necessary to show or amend. Sorry about that committee. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. But another correction, um, an S-182 correction starts on page 34. So S-182, again, removed that credentialing requirement, but it was this section that uh, on at the bottom of page 34 that uh, raised a question on the House side that we didn't discuss on the Senate side, um, where this language is talking about um, how people, the current law used to say if you're credentialed, you can practice within the scope of practice of your license. Well, credentialing got eliminated, um, so it seemed that you still needed to have reference to affiliation with an affiliated agency. So this is starting at the bottom of page 34 is an S-182 correction to say an individual who's licensed as EMS personnel and who's affiliated with an affiliated agency is able to uh, practice fully within their scope of practice. Any questions on that one? Okay, um, moving right along. Page 35 in subdivision C1. Um, this is related to the requirement to get rid of that psychomotor skills testing for EMRs and EMTs. Um, it's a two-step process the way that this bill contemplates this. You'll see this initial amendment to the law here on page 35 to say that uh, psychomotor skills testing for EMRs or EMTs is accomplished by either the demonstration of those skills competencies as part of the education required for that license or by the NREMT psychomotor exam. The testimony to this committee was let's eliminate that psychomotor exam by the NREMT. Um, the way that the feedback before S-124 got voted out of committee um, from the Department of Health was, let's make it a two-step process where for now, you could either demonstrate your psychomotor skills 
or take the NREMT psychomotor skills exam. But on a future effective date, you'll only have to demonstrate the psychomotor skills. You won't have to take that exam. Um, so this is the first step in the process. You'll see there's a, a section 24, I believe, that has a future effective date that I've just flagged um, for DOH feedback on what would be a realistic effective date to completely eliminate the NREMT exam. Okay. Everybody okay with it, Dan? Just a point of clarification. So uh, as I read this, I wanna make sure that we've, uh, we've withheld the ability for a student to choose this, right? Because the way that we envision this process, and I believe the way that the advisor committee envisions this process, at least initially, is that for a, a period of time, we would make the determination as to whether the test needed to be applied or not. Um, I just want to be careful that we're not creating a situation where a student can come and say, I don't want to take the test. I really want to do it the other way. And the law says that I can. So are we in that place? I, I'm just trying to clarify. So the way that I'm reading that language on page 35, and as I understood it, um, it, it would be based on whether the education sufficed to uh, test psychomotor skills testing because it says the psychomotor skills testing shall be accomplished by either the demonstration of those skills competencies as part of the education required for that license or by the NREMT psychomotor exam. So I, I do think it, it's, it seems like it would still fall back on DOH to determine whether the education actually did appropriately test psychomotor skills. Is that how you're reading it? Does that make sense? Yes, Dan. Um, so I, I think I'm reading it that way. You know, I, I want to be, the, the challenge for this is that um, we, we need to use testing as a, a quality assurance measure as we roll this new process through. So as, as we determine whether a class can accomplish it through education, and I think a great many can, um, we need to be able to say to them, if you don't follow these rules, your students are going to test. So uh, I would almost suggest that we make this even a little bit more explicit to that end, just to protect us, to, to protect our ability to continue that process. Um, because again, although I think there's a great many education programs that can do it through education and should do it through education, I can also share with you a couple stories of classes that shouldn't do it. Uh, and those are the ones that I think we need to maintain that testing for to, to have that quality assurance measure. So could I ask you to work with Betsy Ann to come up with some language? Drew, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I'd just like to point out that we did have a uh, advisory meeting and um, discussed a draft um, kind of plan to get to this point uh, over the next six months of development with the um, advisory committee, education subcommittee on how to develop it with a six month kind of uh, pilot program so that we would be um, well underway um, by next year at this time, understanding whether um, and how to um, kind of do that uh, portfolio based testing. So uh, the EMS advisory committee and the education subcommittee of that group has taken this up and um, believes that there's there's merit in moving forward with the health department in developing this program. Good, thank you. Dan? And I'm sorry, but just one more element. Um, so currently right now, we have no capacity as a state to change the rules around advanced EMTs and paramedics. Mm -hmm. So the way this would work would only be allowed for us uh, for the EMT and EMR levels. So uh, I think that may also need to be uh, explicit as well. And, and I think it would be very easy. We can share with uh, Betsy Ann the document that we created for the advisory committee, and we can certainly talk this through. It's, I think these are minor tweaks. Great. Yeah, so, yeah and I, uh, the language right now on page 35, um, starting on line seven, does specify that this is um, okay. only for EMRs and EMTs. Okay. And I just wonder if the um, the clarifying language could be where it says, uh, as part of the education required for that license level, on line 10, I wonder if it would work to add, as approved by the department. 
Yeah. I, I think it would. Okay. Great. Okay. I'm on page 38. I don't know where anybody else is. I'm almost there. I just got to point out that on page 35 and 36, that red language that is getting deleted, um, that was covered in S-182. Mm -hmm. And this is just another credentialing cleanup um, to add in reference to a person needing to be affiliated with an affiliated agency, mm -hmm. that yellow highlighted language. So for example, this subdivision E was about or is about a person essentially getting licensed without exam. Um, and right now it only, the way that S-182 amended it, it arguably could be a red only if you're um, a, a medic. Sorry, that was the language on page 37. But this is essentially just the belts and suspenders language that you still have to be affiliated to enjoy the, um, uh, the benefits of the language that's provided here at the bottom of page 36, top of page 37. Any questions on that? No. Okay. A substantive change on page 37, line nine, is the requirement for the department to establish by rule an entry level certification for Vermont EMS first responders. But that isn't a change since we have done this before. That's correct. That was already in S-124, yeah. and it's just a question of what that rule adoption deadline should be. Yeah, and I think what I'd like to do is have Dan and Drew, whoever, come up with all of every anything that has um, effective dates and deadlines that deal with EMS. Okay. All right. Page 38, you already had this in S-124, but just a reminder, <laughs> there's a requirement to do the sunset review at least once every five years. There is a transitional provision at the end that says DOH will do its first sunset review when it adopts its rules. So it'll just be a question of when that rule adoption deadline is. Okay. Bottom of page 38 is um, establishing, establishing that EMS Education Council. Yep. And so the one... Uh, bit of feedback that came up was um, in regard to the language on page 40. Um, the feedback from DOH in my notes last time was to um, not have this new Education Council approve training. I understood the feedback to be that this committee could still sponsor training. Um, so what I've done here at the bottom of page 40 is to maintain that EMS Education Council, but um, provide that it is to only sponsor training and education pro uh, education programs required for licensure. Any but any comments on that one, Drew? Uh, I'm assuming since I haven't found it that this is the EMS uh, Education Committee that's already part of the advisory, the one that's in existence now. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, you can see that on page 40, line 14, that the committee would establish from among its members this EMS Education Council. Thank you. <laughs> okay. On page 41, I'm just flagging that uh, future effective date section where the uh, requirement or the ability of psychomotor skills to be tested by the NREMT exam would go away. So I just flagged that as just a reminder of we need the uh, effective date for when that could actually happen. Okay. Um, just a, oh, sorry. I see Dan has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my only hesitation with uh, a hard deadline to say we're taking this away is that I think I'm a little concerned that it's gonna take away an important tool for us um, in enforcement. Um, right now, the vision of, uh, of the role of testing as we go forward is for the non-compliant programs to be able to say, since you've not demonstrated this capacity here, we're going to make your students go and test. Um, if we get rid of that capability altogether, 
the only other option we have is to say your class is invalid and now you have 20 students who have spent 16 weeks in an EMT program and nothing to show for it and little recourse to, to take to carry on. Um, I'm all for uh, saying that uh, to put a hard deadline on the capability of using competency-based evaluation for in lieu of testing, but I, I'm reluctant to say get rid of it altogether as a hard deadline. Um, anybody? So would you, I guess, work with Betsy on that and try and figure out how that would be rewarded? I think it would be simple to, to create some language that says uh, on a hard deadline, we will make uh, available uh, competency-based evaluation, a psychomotor evaluation, um, and that uh, it, this will be available to all programs that meet the standards. Um, and again, we'll have to massage the language, of course, but, um, uh, but I, again, I think by, by taking the registry away, you're taking a tool out of the toolbox probably unnecessarily. Okay. Drew? I, I don't object. And I think that was the um, the advisory committee's sense of the kind of the program that we put forward is that leaving that ability uh, was important, but we wanted to shift away from kind of everybody gets tested, but certainly in the event that we needed to provide that test, it should be available somewhere. Committee. Great. Keep okay. Sure. So it sounds like all section, right. Section 24 oh. should just be removed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. If it will be handled by the amendment to that section where if the department approves the education mm -hmm. that you could demonstrate psychomotor skills competencies as part of your education program. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Drew. Does that? I yeah. think so. I, I just want to give it a little bit of a deeper dive to look at it, but I, I believe that will work. We want as many psychomotor skills as possible. <laughs> uh, just maybe a reminder. Maybe yeah. let's just like, need this training too. Uh, uh, just a reminder here on page 42 that um, what's happening on lines seven and eight is just adding our existing EMRs and the newly proposed certified first responders as um, EMS personnel that are eligible to get the current law uh, funding stream, that annual 150,000. Oh, Madam Chair, you're um, you're muted. Oh, thank you. Um, speaking of training money, did you see that the Budget Adjustment Act that we passed this morning has three million dollars in there for EMS? <laughs> okay. And related to that, uh, Section Twenty Six, which was in the bill as uh, passed the committee, would be removed because that is the much lesser appropriated amount. <laughs> yes, let's get rid of that. Well, look where we began, though. Good to re remind ourselves of, for sad reasons. I mean, when we began this, it was a totally different world. Mm -hmm. okay, Although so I'm not okay. sure that it really was a totally different world for the not for EMS. EMS providers. I think that they right. were in dire straits then, and right. they, yeah. Right. I, I I agree, but I think the world has become, became radically more sympathetic to these needs and understanding. Okay, so. All right. Now we're- 27 is a date here. that we need to address. Yep. Now we're getting into all the dates for the rollout of all this EMS uh, new language. I, and I instead like of going- pink. Allison? Nothing, I just, I like the highlighting in bright pink. Instead no. of going through them, what I would suggest is that you and Dan and Drew 
figure them out instead of trying to figure them out here now and come to us with a proposal for what those dates might be um, looking at all of them together. All right. Does that work? I'll await the word. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go to section 28. That's the public safety planning. And Commissioner, are you still with us? I don't think oh he my is. God. Oh. No. Um, okay. Well, I think we talked about this um, this morning. And um, we uh, let me let me see if um, we actually agreed on what we talked about. Is that this when the commissioner talked to us? He was talking more about emergency planning, and by the towns, and we haven't changed that requirement at all. So, however, they currently work with the state emergency management. They're going to continue to work with them in the same manner. All we're asking is that they use the same um, procedure to develop a public safety plan for the town. Is that what we talked about committee? And do we do agree want, with leaving this in? Yes, we had this discussion earlier this afternoon. Do you want me yes. to text him and ask him to rejoin us? No, we, he doesn't have to. I'm sure he's very busy. Um, Senator Collimore, Senator Bray, <laughs> Senator Polina. I'm good. We did talk about it. We, we did. I just wanted to <coughs> make sure that um, in case people were still with us. Okay. So moving on now to, whoa, we just covered a whole bunch of pages. Yes. Those are two long sections. I mean, three long sections, 28, 29, and 30. Yeah, you're at the end. Section 30 is the ACCD uh, a $100,000 appropriation for the uh, Regional Planning Commission Public Safety Planning Grants. Public Safety Planning Grants. And um, I have no idea well, how, if appropriations even talked about this yet at all but we should leave it there <coughs> and it'll go to them and they'll either approve it or take it out. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, would it be possible to include sheriff's offices as a regional organization? To... Uh... Let's see. So that would be on page 49, starting um, lines four and five. Mm -hmm. I guess it could. I. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think so because I would not necessarily because they're one of the groups that we're hoping will be involved, but not, I mean, aren't we talking there about who's going to convene? So uh, I guess the reason I ask is that uh, there's 14 different counties with 14 different responses to 14 different issues. Uh, and so, for example, Grand Isle provides, uh, the Grand Isle Sheriff's Office provides an emergency operations center which does a lot of this type of work. Uh, we've talked about uh, developing uh, something similar in my county. Uh, and so uh, where towns have a need to do uh, emergency planning and public safety planning, they also often rely on what I'll refer to as the regionalized uh, partners, which many sheriff's offices sometimes serve. So being able to do that uh, effectively uh, puts professionals who are doing emergency planning work uh, in a position to be able to provide that service to the area. Uh, it's not 
uh, I guess my request won't be to compel that we get the funding, but rather make us eligible to apply for it, uh, as there are agencies that do this throughout the state. Yeah, but but, I, but our, I guess our 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 hope. I mean, you're definitely a regional organization. It, it, it's just, but you're one of the agencies that we're hoping will be uh, one of the the agencies that, that will have many agencies all as regional as you are. We're, I mean, not that, I mean, it's a public safety planning grant and, and you're a key piece of the regional public safety piece. And we, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm Brian. Unfair, but. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know whether it's covered on line five and six which says, or other qualified organization uh, when they apply to ACCD. I would say that if the ACCD folks think that the local sheriff uh, association or organization is uh, qualified, so be it. And, and Betsy Ann, should that say organizations with an S? No, it's- no such as a regional commission union thing or other qualified organization. Somebody is going to apply. Some regional right. organization is going to apply. If, if four regional organizations in the same area apply, my guess is ACCD is gonna tell them to get it together and figure out who's gonna apply because you can't have four organizations in the same region applying. and. This, this is primarily, this isn't implementation really, this is plan, a planning and that's why we put the planning commissions in there because that's what they do is, but I, I agree with Brian that um, we hesitated to start putting in um, any regional organization by name because there are a lot of, a lot right. of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's regional development corporations who some of them may feel that they qualify. Um, so could I ask Betsy Ann whether she feels that uh, a sheriff's department could be a qualified organization? Well, the way that this language is currently structured, it really it would be up to ACCD to determine qualification. Um, I was envisioning this language originally more closely to what Senator Clarkson was um, indicating um, that the grants were really more toward regional entities, but I also didn't think of the sheriff's department in the manner that Sheriff Anderson was describing. So maybe it's just me not having that in mind. Also, yeah, I, I feel like um, the sheriffs are one of the entities we're hoping will be included. I mean, it's, it's almost like a comp like one of the people we're hoping will be a player in in improving the regional response effort in public safety. I don't know. It strikes me as slightly competitive that that to have that as a voice being. <coughs> Organizing the discussion when they're one of the entities we're wanting to be part of it is a little awkward. I, I, I'm not able to articulate exactly what I'm saying, but well, they strike I, I, me as one of the players and, and not necessarily the appropriate disinterested party that should be convening them all for the conversation. I think that is the key word there that it's a disinterested party. And yeah, I and think then, you might, <clears throat> what if you, and ACCD may say in some county, the county sheriff might be the appropriate uh, regional organization, but in some county, they may not be at all. And if you're talking up here about your, if the, if the sheriff's office is the one that convenes this planning group, is there automatically um, antagonism set up with all the other um, public safety um, Yes, entities I, in the in the region because I think that that's we want to avoid that we want it to be um, want it to be uh, 
right organized yeah. facilitated by somebody who has no dog in the fight right exactly disinterested does that answer that at all mark it does and uh i think that ccd has the latitude to make that decision uh and it makes sense for example grand isle county then that is perfectly fine and uh we look forward to being part of the solution and remember there are only three okay <clears throat> So now I think that we are done, except for the um, languages that need to come from um, the Department of Health and EMS around. Um, there's a couple languages in there to make sure that we're saying the right thing and then the effective dates or the deadlines. Am I right about that committee? Right. Oh, Chris Bray just moved. Again, he just moved to Bristol. <laughs> okay, now I do, I would like to get this done as soon as possible so that we can get, because it's going to have to go to appropriations. And as much as possible, we would like to pass this bill this year. So is it is it possible to have that done by tomorrow afternoon? The date? And Betsy Drew? And they're all nodding their heads. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're not shaking. Yeah, I have very, I have just a few amendments to make and then I'll just be able to fill in the dates um, whenever you're, you're, you're able to let me know what the dates should be. Okay. Committee? Sounds good. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Absolutamente. <laughs> All right, let's finish this tomorrow and try and get it wrapped up and voted out. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So, so, Madam Chair, will this be the only thing on tomorrow's agenda? Oh, well, I don't know. I have to, I guess I have to look at what else we need to do. Committee. Okay. You know, this phone is in here and my phone answer is falling down on his job. <laughs> <laughs> what else, committee? Um, we've passed all our bills. I don't know that we've gotten any more from the house, have we? I'm sure we will. Clerk, have you brought any more down? Yeah. I've gotten so much exercise bringing those downstairs. <laughs> um, we have some spares in natural resources and energy, if you'd like. I mean, you're knocking it out of the park. Maybe I could give you something little. Like <coughs> 250 bill? Sure. Oh, yeah. we, we could, could do that. 250. We'll do it. Excellent. We're game. We're game for anything there, Senator Bragg. Okay. So let's finish this up tomorrow. And then if you think of other things that need to be on the agenda, send them to me. And <clears throat> I would actually at some point, but not tomorrow, maybe Thursday, I would love to do what we were going to do before um, we had to leave the state house and get a, an update on our burn pit bill. Uh, he, he, as you may have read, um, our wonderful witness uh, has actually sued the VA. Wesley? Yes. Good. Well, I'd like to get an update. Does that, do the rest of you want to get some kind of yes. an update on that? Sure. Yes. I, I think that's great. <clears throat> okay. So I'll, we'll, Gail, I'll send you, let's figure out when, when we can do that because we want to give people enough time. So tomorrow, let's just finish this and, um, if any emergency thing comes up, otherwise we'll be done early. Does that work? You bet. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so see you at eight o'clock in the morning. What's at eight?
I thought there was an all committee, all Senate meeting. It's at eight thirty. Sad. Yeah, and I, I don't know how we. I mean, I, I'm. It just seems short because we have a nine o'clock joint hearing with the House, so in Senate Economic Development, so. Uh, half an hour. We have lots to discuss. I'm I'm impressed that they, he thinks we can do it all in half an hour. Or maybe you'll just have to leave. Oh well, what a thought. There is yeah. that. The indication was we wouldn't be done until 9:45. Peter Sterling said that. <clears throat> oh, did he? Mm -hmm. 9:45. Okay. Okay. I think we have judiciary at 10. <laughs> and the, oh, the other thing that I would like for us to discuss at some point is the um, the finances of the sheriff's offices. Mark has sent me some information on that, and um, I'll send that out to everybody today, and we can look at it tomorrow or Thursday. Betsy Ann? <clears throat> uh, we got a reply back from Secretary Bloomer advising that the Senate Rules Committee has not approved the elections bill. So I just wanted to put that on your radar that um, Senate Rules Committee will need to approve it before Senate GovOps can introduce it. Okay. I'll <clears throat> ask them to meet maybe at 945 tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you. All right. So, sorry, sorry uh, I was just reading Tucker's email. Um, we're, we are on tomorrow afternoon after the floor, and we're anticipating that being at what, two? Oh, I don't know. Are you doing your bill tomorrow, Brian? Yes, I think you can figure on 90 minutes on the floor tomorrow. Okay. So, 2.30? Just a guess. <laughs> Well, as a reminder, I'm starting the call at 1.30 for anybody who wants to just join and and wait for the Senate to finish. A little okay. bit it's on S190. I, I there was Senator McDonald was getting questions. I have a feeling that the, we won't get stuck. But it's um, a bill with pluses and minuses, and if we really start to get into it, it's a slow way down. I think when the pro temp spoke last, that was kind of a, uh, no one loves this bill, but it's probably a decent thing to just <coughs> head with. So maybe we'll be fine on the floor. I would hope so. I mean, we can sometimes beat things to death. Yes. We do have that ability to do. Okay, so tomorrow afternoon, we'll only do 124 then, since I forgot we were on the floor. <clears throat> we'll only do 124 and finish that up. And Thursday, we'll look at the financing for the sheriffs <clears throat> and anything else that <clears throat> anybody has. And if we can get people for Friday, we'll do um, an update on the burn pit. If not, we'll put it till the next Tuesday. Uh, we are in good shape. We're you're in we're in excellent shape. Oh, do you have a notion from Sarah Copeland as to what else is coming to us from them? That's a top priority. No, I <clears throat> I don't. I think that my understanding is that we've got everything that were their top priorities. but I will check again. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Thank go you. enjoy the heat. <laughs> oh.